Good afternoon and welcome back to another episode of The Longing, where today we are going to be continuing to read Moby Dick. So, let's get going. We're going to finish off the chapter we started yesterday. Caught and twisted, corkscrewed in the mazes of the line, loose harpoons and lances, with all their bristling barbs and points, came flashing and dripping up to the chocks in the bows of Ahab's boat. Only one thing could be done. Seizing the boat knife, he critically reached within, through, and then without, the rays of steel, dragged in the line beyond, passed it, inboard, to the bowsman, and then, twice sundering the rope near the chocks, dropped the intercepted fager of steel into the sea and was all fast again. That instant the white whale made a sudden rush among the remaining tangles of the other lines, by so doing irresistibly dragged the more involved boats of stub and flask towards his flukes, dashed them together like two rolling husks on a surf-beaten beach, and then, diving down into the sea, disappeared in a boiling maelstrom, in which, for a space, the odorous cedar chips of the wrecks danced round and round like the grated nutmeg in a swiftly stirred bowl of punch. While the two crews were yet circling in the waters, reaching out after the revolving line tubs, oars and other floating furniture, while a slope little flask bobbed up and down like an empty vial, twitching his legs upwards to escape the dreaded jaws of sharks, and Stubb was lustily singing out for someone to ladle him up, and while the old man's line, now parting, admitted of his pulling into the creamy pool to rescue whom he could, in that wild simultaneousness of a thousand concreted perils, Ahab's yet unstricken boat seemed drawn up towards heaven by invisible wires, as arrow-like shooting, per arrow arrow -like shooting perpendicularly from the sea, the white whale dashed his broad forehead against its bottom and sent it, turning over and over, into the air, till it fell again, gunwale downwards, and Ahab and his men struggled out from under it, like seals from a seaside cave. The first uprising momentum of the whale, modifying its direction as he struck the surface, involuntarily launched him along it to a little distance from the centre of the destruction he had made and with his back to it, he now lay for a moment, slowly feeling with his flukes from side to side, and whenever a stray oar, bit of plank, the least chip or crumb of the boats touched his skin, his tail swiftly drew back and came sideways, smiting the sea. But soon, as if satisfied that his work for that time was done, he pushed his pleated forehead through the ocean, and trailing after him, the in intertangled lines continued his leeward way at a traveller's methodic pace. As before, the attentive ship, having described the whole fight, again came bearing down to the rescue, and dropping a boat, picked up the floating mariners, tubs, oars, and whatever else could be caught at, and safely landed them on her decks. Some sprained shoulders, wrists and ankle, ankles, livid contusions, wrenched harpoons and lances, inextricable intricacies of rope, shattered oars and planks. All these were there, but no fatal or even serious ill seemed to have befallen anyone. As with Fadala the day before, so Ahab was now found grimly clinging to his boat's broken half, which afforded a comparatively easy float, nor did it so exhaust him as the previous day's mishap. But when he was helped to the deck, all eyes were fastened upon him, as instead of standing by himself, he still half hung upon the shoulder of Starbuck, who had thus far been the foremost to assist him. His ivory leg had been snapped off, leaving but one short, sharp splinter. Ay, ay, Starbuck, tis sweet to lean sometimes. Be the leaner who he will. And would old Ahab had leaned oftener than he has, 
The ferule has not stood, sir, said the carpenter, now coming up. I put good work into that leg. But no bro bones broken, sir, I hope, said Stubb with true concern. Aye, and all splintered to pieces, Stubb. Do you see it? But even with a broken bone, old Ahab is untouched. And I count no living bone of mine, one jot more me, than this dead one that's lost. Nor white whale, nor man, nor fiend, can so much as graze old Ahab in his own proper and in inaccessible being. Can any lead touch yonder floor? Or is it lead? Can any lead touch yonder floor? Any mast scrape yonder roof? Aloft there, which way? Dead to leeward, sir. Up helm, then. Pile on the sail again. Shipkeepers. Down the rest of the spare boats and rig them. Mr. Starbuck, away, and muster the boat's crews. Let me first help thee towards the bulwark, sir. Oh, 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 how this splinter gores me now. A cursed fate, that the unconquerable captain in the soul should have such a craven mate. Sir, my body man, not thee. Give me something for a cane there. That shivered lance will do. Muster the men. Surely I have not seen him yet. By heaven it cannot be. Missing. Quick, call them all. The old man's hinted thought was true. Upon mustering the company, the Parsee was not there. The Parsee, cried Stubb, he must have been caught in. The black vomit wrench thee, run all of ye above, a low cabin, forecastle, find him, not gone, not gone. But quickly they returned to him, with the tidings that the Parsee was nowhere to be found. Aye, sir, said Stubb, caught among the tangles of your line. I thought I saw him dragging under. My line, my line, gone, gone. What means that little word? What death knell rings it in it? That old Ahab shakes as if he were the belfry. The harpoon, too. Toss over the litter there. Do you see it? The forged iron men. The white whales. No, no, no. Blistered fool. This hand did dart it. Tis in the fish. Aloft there. Keep him nailed. Quick. All hands to the rigging of the boats. Collect the oars. Harpooners. The irons. The irons. Hoist the royals higher. A pull on all the sheets. Helm there. Steady. Steady for your life. I'll ten times girdle the unmeasured globe, yea, and dive straight through it, but I'll slay him yet. Great God, but for one single instant show thyself, cried Starbuck. Never, never wilt thou capture him, old man. In Jesus' name, no more of this. That's worse than devil's madness. Two days chased, twice stove to splinters, thy very leg once more snatched from under thee. Thy evil shadow gone, all good angels mobbing thee with warnings. What more wouldst thou have? Shall we keep chasing this murderous fish till he swamps the last man? Shall we be dragged by him to the bottom of the sea? Shall we be towed by him to the infernal world? Oh, oh, impiety and blasphemy to hunt him more. Starbuck, of late, I felt strangely, strangely moved to thee. Ever since that hour we both saw, thou knowest what, in one another's eyes. But in this matter of the whale, be the front of thy face to me as the palm of this hand, a lipless, unfeatured blank. Ahab is forever Ahab, man. This whole acts immutably decreed. T'was rehearsed by thee and me a billion years before this ocean rolled. Fool, I am the fate's lieutenant. I act under orders. Look thou, underling, and thou obeyest mine. Stand round me, men. Ye see an old man cut down to the stump, leaning on a shivered lance, propped up on a lonely foot. Tis Ahab, his body's part, but Ahab's soul's a centipede that moves upon a hundred legs. I feel strained, half-stranded as ropes that tow dismasted frigates in a gale and I may look so. But ere I break, ye'll hear me crack. Until ye hear that, 
know that Ahab's Hauser tows his purpose yet. Believe ye, men, in the things called omens? Then laugh aloud and cry on core, for ere they drown, drowning things will twice rise to the surface, then rise again to sink for evermore. So with Moby Dick, two days he's floated, tomorrow will be the third. Aye, men, he'll rise once more, but only to spout his last. Do you feel brave, men? Brave? As fearless fire, cried Stubb. And as mechanical, muttered Ahab. Then as the men went forward, he muttered on, the things called omens, and yesterday I talked the same to Starbuck there, concerning my broken boat. Oh, how valiantly I seek to drive out of others' hearts what's clinched so fast in mine. The Parsi, the Parsi, gone, gone, and he was to go before, but still was to be seen again ere I could perish. How's that? There's a riddle now might baffle all the lawyers backed by the ghosts of the whole line of judges. Like a hawk's beak it pecks my brain. I'll... I'll solve it, though. When dusk descended, the whale was still in sight to leeward. So once more the sail was shortened, and everything passed nearly as on the previous night. Only the sound of hammers and the hum of the grindstone was heard till nearly daylight, as the men toiled by lanterns, in the complete and careful rigging of the spare boats, and sharpening their fresh weapons for the morrow. Meantime, of the broken keel of Ahab's wrecked craft, the carpenter made him another leg, while still, as on the night before, slouched Ahab stood fixed within his scuttle, his hid, heliotrope glance, anticipatingly gone backward on its dial, sat due eastward, for the earliest sun. And with that, we come to the end of the chapter and also the end of the episode. So I'm going to say thank you very much for joining me today. I hope you all have a wonderful um, morning, evening, afternoon or night, no matter what time of day it is. I hope you all have a wonderful one of it. And as always, we will be back tomorrow for more of The Longing. Goodbye.